think we firstly wanted to try to put our heads together and thank every single person who helped us out at JordanCon. And, and, and I mentioned one or two people in our JordanCon recap, and I know I missed almost everybody, and I feel bad about that. So I want to make sure I, I try and actually make an effort to pick everyone up. So many people were kind and generous to us. The organizers were awesome. So many of our fans showed up and who went out of their way to do things like um, make the ribbons. That was DT. Thank you, DT. Yeah, huge thank you to DT. He bought the cast iron pan, um, so he actually bumped up the price of that sucker and gave quite a bit of money to charity for us. He bought all the ribbons for us and distributed those. And DT came out both years, so this was his second year and our second year. So our our first years were all our first years, and and it was it was great to see him again. You know, it was like of course a DT is like such the Canadian. He's so nice and um, so easy to get along with, and so fun <laughs> to hang out with. I forgot he was there. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I'm sorry, DT. You're you're wonderful. Thank you so much for being there and for helping us out. You've you've been a good friend, and uh, I'll see you at SpoilerCon. Um, and I think we should thank Neil while we're on the spoilers people track. Just because I always love his deep, rumbling Ogier voice. He has an incredible deep voice, and he was just fun to hang out with. <laughs> Everybody does. And, I mean, a lot of people came out, but... Um... And for some reason, that brings uh, Talir to mind, uh, who's also there. We got to meet her for the first time, which was awesome. She's been helping us out hugely with um, SpoilerCon, and it was you know great to put a name to a face and a voice, because definitely a commanding personality, and it was great to actually get to meet her. Yes, a lot of planning going into SpoilerCon. I'm going to use that since it's in my head to, if you're listening to this right now, go to SpoilerCon.org and check it out. Started as a meetup that was just supposed to be like a couple of local folks or folks that are local to us um, to who are going to like meet up and have a drink. And it it's turning into something much more elaborate. I, I will say this, and um, I want to say I cannot guarantee this, but it's looking likely that we're going to have Kate Redding and Michael Kramer Skype in to a call and we'll be able to basically listen to them talk and ask them questions and they may do a reading. Um, they'll be on a projector. So that's freaking awesome. I, I saw that uh, Agonor is working on that. Yeah. And this is something that's like beyond our wildest dreams when it was like, Hey, let's, let's show up at a bar. And if anyone wants to get coffee with or beer with us, We'll have a beer with you. That was like last year. This year. <laughs> <laughs> and then a lot of have, people showed up. We had to rent an Airbnb to house everyone. And I mean, it all worked out great and it was lovely. But I think this year is going to be a lot bigger. And we're just hoping that we're able to plan <laughs> well enough. Right, right. Was just, we're sort of being hit with a, a bit of a, a con truck. Um, but one of the real benefits, I think, is I just want to thank everyone on the planning committee who was at the con um spe specifically christini um and talir and neil i wanted to get those three names out there because we were all talking and looking around and saying hey how are they doing it how can we do <laughs> you know what what can we take away from this con and bring to ours which again isn't super con like it's just sort of going to be a bunch of people getting together there's not really going to be a lot any there's not going to be any panels there's not going to be a whole lot of events. It's pr it's pretty bare bones, a uh, couple of meals, a couple of live recordings, and just a bunch of people hanging out in a hostel uh, where you can either get your own room or a bunk bed, but it's going to be fun. Bunch of Wheel of Time nerds. So if yeah. you're into that, you should consider coming out. To Portland, and pretty much Oregon. the entire Wheel of Time spoilers crew from Jordan Con is going to be there. Uh, we did we we thanked the hell out of Kirky last time, but you know, again, honorable mention. Thank you, Kirky. Especially for the scotch. Especially for the scotch. <laughs> so good. And your company. And your conversation. Um, we can thank Abigail. I think we remembered her in the last Jordan mm -hmm. Con related recording. But she sent us some really cute gifts. You should guys should go check out Geek Dio Studios. Go Google that. Uh, and also a huge thank you to DT for retrieving those and delivering them to us. Apparently he went significantly out of his way to do that. Oh, so, gosh, yes, that as yeah. well. 
So thank you. D- again, call back to DT, you fucking Kindest rock man. man. Right. A couple of other people who we saw last year and again this year, um, Mr. Varen Stormblessed, a.k.a. Uh, the other Seth. Um, hey. Seth number two. Uh, so he was back this year, this time without a beard, so it took us a minute to recognize him. He shaved his beard and lost 30 pounds. I had no idea who he was. <laughs> you know, I got him right away. It was in the eyes. Yeah, I saw him. Well, I and he told me that he looked a little different before hit the hand, so I was kind of looking looking out for that. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, his whole family. Saren and Lisa. I had a lot of fun hanging out with them. I spent a lot of time with them over the weekend. Saren's great. She's uh, one our really our biggest um, Mistborn spoiler, one of our biggest Mistborn spoilers behind Cody, of course, uh, <laughs> supporters. And she's going to be taking over Mistborn merch. Um, so hopefully that is going to actually get out to people uh, because it won't depend on me getting off my ass and doing it anymore. And in the same token, for those of you who want Watt Spoilers merch, that is getting taken over by Christine. And so she is going to also be responding more quickly to and Patreon donations. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, for your patience. I'm working very hard to make sure that you actually get your stuff in a reasonable amount of time. I think I also wanted to thank um, Tom D. Simone and Shannon Lieb, who are two kind of J- J- Jordan Con organizers that I feel like were um, either instrumental in helping us get in there and or and or instrumental in getting us set up so that we were knew what we were doing. Those two specifically, I feel like really worked with us in uh, helping us figure out what it is to be a discussion panelist at a convention, which is something we've never done before. Well, and I, as far as I'm aware, I think I give Tom all the credit for us actually being guests. My understanding is he fought for us to. Um, That's what it sounded like. Yeah, I, I don't see. I don't know anything about the behind the scenes. No, stuff, we don't but either. That's the you impression know, that's that a, I got. <laughs> that's just sort of a third hand um, knowledge. Thing. I did. I sent him a, a thank you note privately right after the con, and he got back. But and that's really nice. But it's it's nice to give these people shouts. Totally. Well, of course, our wonderful floor mate kelsey kelsey miss name speaker who uh crashed with us three out of the four nights um and was i was such a good roommate i forgot she was there uh yeah but no it was great <laughs> she it took was, a picture she took a picture in the discord room. <laughs> beautiful we weren't Wonderful. using that piece of floor anyway no not at all um and and then she was just nice to have you know someone she's kelsey's just a wonderful person to talk to you should always um, I still think she would make a fantastic Brigida in the show. Uh, she dressed up as Brigida at the at the thing, and in what was a minimalist costume, but because it was so Brigida looks so much like her, like it it was immediately obvious immediately what she was doing. Uh, Kelsey, put your headshots into the show. I think you uh, you've got a chance. Ever do any acting, Kelsey? Uh, doesn't matter. Go for it. And yes, she's got the physique for it too, because she's a rock climber. So, just saying, I don't think she'd have any trouble pulling back a bow. Uh, <laughs> she's been lifting herself up mountains, pulling back a bow, not a problem. Also, shout out to Songstress, uh, who discovered us last Jordan Con, um, and from someone last year who was kind of like, I'm not really sure who you are, to this year it was like, you're great. Like, I, it was such a great turnaround. Oh, yeah, they've been around in the Discord a lot. I didn't make the connection that that was someone we had met at JordanCon. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Christini, who invited us out to dinner. That was yep. a really pleasant idea. I'm glad we went out to dinner pretty much every day. It was a nice break from the con chaos. Um, that that was that was a really good idea. And uh, There's Metal Detura, uh, and she uh, let me borrow her charger in a critical, critical moment, and I got stuck... I was, that's the night I was watching Game of Thrones, and there was no getting out of that room. I was the furthest away from the door, and there was literally bile, bodies piled in, like between me. I couldn't get out of there without <laughs> stepping on people, literally. And she's like, she, I want to go. She wanted to go home, but I had her charging cable that she needed to get home with, and so she was like trying to get in. Yeah, and I, I couldn't get out. And of course, you know that that episode. I thought it was like a forty-five minute episode. No, it's like eighty-seven. Like, it's a full-on movie. <laughs> and we got a late start because we had to wait for the projector to set up. So it was a solid, like, after I went in there, I was locked in for a solid 110 minutes. So nearly two hours. 
Oh, yeah. And then Kelsey uh, attempted to get it from me and knocked and opened the door in the middle of Game of Thrones. And if you've ever opened the door on a dark room in the middle of uh, Game of Thrones, the death looks you get are not pleasant. <laughs> so thank you, Kelsey, for uh, it's sticking okay, Kelsey, your foot I'm sure in that they don't remember death. who you are. <laughs> I've got four more names on my list. Go for it. Uh, Zarth, of course, which we did yes. thank last time, but I wanted to bring him up again. He was the wise man of the the con. Moradin showed up and asked a couple of questions. Uh, I didn't really – I think I shook his hand once, but his dog had some – wasn't able to really be in the con for very long, and so he had to be back and forth. Um, so I didn't really get a chance to meet him all that Aww. much. I don't know that I did. Yeah. I met a million people. Now I'm feeling immediately bad if I did or I don't know. I don't think so, though. I tried to ask for everybody's username because, like, when I met Zarth, when I first introduced myself to him, I was like, hey, I'm, he was like, hey, man, I'm like, hey, I'm Patrick, and he's like, hey, I'm Jeff, and I'm like, mm. <laughs> I, I I can never remember, unless people's usernames, like, involves their real name, I, I won't, I won't be able to make a connection. Uh, Gammy, uh, he was the other guy in the Miscloak who I taught, yeah. we, we were, uh, basically, we got to pay... Well, Hank, I got to teach him how to steal with juggling, which is a pretty little simple trick to learn if you already know how to juggle. But um, we got to spend that night uh, passing balls back and forth. He was so a really I, nice guy. He was a really nice guy. That's when and we were hanging out in the lobby on the first. I, I'm, I'm going to stop trying to say what day, what happened on what day. But that yeah. was one of the times we were hanging out in the lobby. <laughs> that was, I think, that was the first night. It was really, really. I think on. it was. Yeah. Um, and so, and he's been super nice. I don't know if you see all his comments on Facebook. He's been super supportive. Yeah, then, really, really nice guy. Jenny's also a sweetheart. She and DT are a good match. Yes. I wanted to start with DT and end with his wife. That's why I did it in that order. And she was a sweetheart, and she had a great costume, and she and was just... selling art in the... Yes, and right, we got her ribbons. Um, <clears throat> can we shout out her webpage really quick? Yeah, her... Uh, Instagram is at Riverside Creative Cottage. So go to go to Instagram at Riverside Creative College to check out her stuff. Um, the only other people that I wanted to quickly thank uh, were Jess and Jen from the White Tower Podcast and Daniel Green, who we've done collabs with before. We're kind of fellow Watt internet entertainer people, however you uh, say that. And we got to do the collaborative panel. And just kind of hung out with them quite a bit over the weekend. And it was it was really nice to meet them, put a face to the name. Um, yeah, they're just nice folks, nice to work with. And we'll be doing another collaborative recording uh... when Wednesday, so six days from now. Oh, one more name. Uh, Lord Luca uh, showed up, and he was there during the live recording, and he asked some really good questions and had some really good points. Oh, yeah, Luca. He hangs out here sometimes. Thanks yeah. for coming up, coming by, Luca. A lot of people came to our panels who I mean, we couldn't possibly name them all, but thank you, everyone. Yeah. There are two girls who came to the live recording who I was not familiar with, and they gave me their names, but uh, I, I, you know, I have empty head syndrome at that point. Um, so if I, I'm sorry, I forgot who you were, but uh, thank you for coming to the live recording. Um, just I'm super excited to have Ariel Burgess on next week to talk about art and um you know her, the situation uh, well whatever she wants to talk about and uh i also want to uh just talk to her about art and how you know what her process is for creating these characters and and of course what we ask everybody which is how did you find the wheel of time and what does it mean to you um and then i'm also super excited to start planning to have you know michael kramer and kate redding um you know do a remote appearance it's just going to be amazing it's going to be amazing so the, the connections we made the people i talked to you know the, the the folks that i got to sit next to and shake hands with and um we had plenty of chances to talk to harriet but we've totally chickened out on them um because she's super intimidating <laughs> i said that out loud to uh to some people while sitting in the smoking area at jordan con and uh i like walked inside and walked back in they were like yeah we set up a meeting <laughs> <laughs> for for next year i guess so yeah yeah so we've been we've been forced <clears throat> to meet harriet next year just because we were we chickened out this year 
No, that's good. That's what I need. I was like sitting next to her a bunch of times and I just was felt too nervous to be like, hi, <laughs> you don't know me and I'm sure you do this all the time, but <laughs> I'm Patrick. The only time she looked at me really like significantly was when I was doing the costume contest and uh, I was sort of telling her about the cloak and I'm not sure what I said. That's that's the words coming out of my mouth had no relationship to what was going through my head. But she's wonderful and lovely and it's like talking to Cod Swain. Maria is wonderful. I love Maria. Oh yeah, I also uh I've had several longish conversations with her in the past and I didn't realize I didn't know who she was. I didn't know that that was Harriet's assistant. Yeah. It's like she just is a nice lady that smokes Virginia Slims. I'm pretty sure. Okay, I think that's everything I had to say guys oh um go check out our other projects as well while we're shouting things out and advertising us advertising um go check out just roll with it.net that's r-o-l-e um that's my D D podcast that i do with a bunch of people who were at the con so uh christine was there um, I was there, and then there's a couple other folks um, who showed up. Also, go check out Mistborn Spoilers, which is the other podcast we do. If you like Mistborn, you know, we totally get into that, and there's starting to be a bit of a backlog of episodes. So go binge it. We're about to finish book one. Um, so totally check that out as well. We've talked a lot about SpoilerCon. Go to SpoilerCon.org. Check us out. We're a little Wheel of Time meetup group so far. Um, maybe not quite enough to call it a convention, but... A lot of us are going to be hanging out. There are accommodations. Oh, and go support us on Patreon. We're about to hit one of our goals, and then we have to think about like what our next goal is. And we're pretty excited to to maybe have um, you know a real serious shot at making this full time. Go to, if if nothing else, go check out our Patreon. Um, That's the dream. Yeah, guys, that's the best way to support us. We are if you like, really if you like close. what we're doing. Yeah, if you like what we're doing, go throw us a buck a month on on Patreon. And we are at like 320 supporters, which is amazing. Thank you to all 320 people out there. Um, all the people who have, we have read your name. Um, thank you. We, you know, we should probably go down a big list and just reread them all. Uh, for everyone who we haven't read your name yet, stay tuned. It should be coming soon. This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Your hosts are Seth Jacobson and Patrick Heiler. Hi, I'm Seth. And I'm Patrick. Chapter 49, Cold Rock's Hold, and our symbol is the shield and spears. Frowning, Rand looked around. A mile ahead stood a tight cluster of tall, sheer-sided buttes, or perhaps one huge butte, broken by fissures. To his left, the land ran off in patches of tough grass and leafless, spiny plants, scattered thorny bushes and low trees, across arid hills and jagged gullies, past huge, rough stone columns to jagged mountains in the distance. To the right, the land was the same, except the cracked yellowish clay lay flatter, the mountains closer. It could have been any piece of the waste he had seen since leaving Kandar, or Chandar. Where? he said. Rurik glanced at Avienda, who was looking at Rand as though he had lost his wits. Come, let your own eyes show you cold rocks. Dropping his shufa to his shoulders, the clan chief turned and loped bareheaded toward the fissured rock wall ahead. The Shido had already halted, milling about and beginning to set up their tents. Hearn and the Jindo fell in behind the Ruark at a trot with their pack mules, uncovering their heads and shouting wordlessly, and the maidens escorting the peddlers cried for the drivers to hasten their team and follow the Jindo. One of the wise ones lifted her skirts to her knees and ran, ran to join Ruark. Ran thought it was a meese. From the pale hair, surely Bear could not move that nimbly. But the rest of the wise one's party maintained its original pace. For a moment, Moraine looked as if she would break away, toward Rand, then hesitated, arguing with one of the other wise ones, hair still hidden by her shawl. Finally, the eyes said I reined her white mare back beside Egwene's gray and Land's black stallion just ahead of the white-robed guy Shane, who were tugging the pack animals along. They were heading the same way as Ruark and the others, though. Ran leaned down to offer a hand to Avienda. When she shook her head, he said, If they are going to be making all that noise, I won't be able to hear you down there. What if I make a woolhead mistake, because I can't hear what you say? Muttering under her breath, she glanced at the maidens around the peddler's wagons, 
then sighed and clasped his arm. He hoisted her up, ignoring her indignant squawk, and swung her onto Jayadeen behind the saddle. Whenever she tried to mount by herself, she came close to pulling him out of the saddle. He gave her a moment to settle her heavy skirts, though, at best they bared her legs well above her soft knee-high boots, then heeled the dapple to a canter. It was the first time Avienda had ridden faster than a walk. She flung her arms around his waist and hung on. Smooth. <laughs> a couple of questions. Yeah. So, first of all, just, you know, I don't often read all of the descriptions. I feel like I know what things are. And so as I'm going through them, I either sort of space out during the audiobook or like I, I skim them. But I got to say, this is a chapter full of just gorgeous descriptions. And they're worth really like spending the time to absorb and picture the sort of rift in the rocks that is the hold. I, I really enjoy wa watching that. Yeah, that's cool. And it, this is something we've talked about uh, quite a bit in the last couple of episodes but it looks so much like Dune, where you come up to like a Fremen, I don't remember what they call them, but you know, in Aiel culture, it's called a hold. And you, when Rand mm -hmm. looks at it, he's like, what, where, <laughs> where you, you said we're here, but it looks like there's just some, some rocks and dirt and like a couple of cactuses. I don't see anything. I think it looks like a tabletop rock plateau from the outside. With big cracks running through it, but and then it sort of opens up with a hollow on the inside, right? So it's it's kind of hidden from the outside. Like unless you went over it, you would never know that there's a reason to go to this place. Mm -mm. No, and it's like you said, the closest thing the Aiel have to a city they actual actually in inhabit. Unlike, of course, Ruidian, which they don't live in. I also I already said this, but I really enjoy Avienda's descriptions of what she's explaining to Rand what's happening as it happens, which is like perfect for for especially a new reader but even for me as someone who's read this multiple times um you know i totally forgot that when avienda says you must enter a hold with your face clear to be seen and make noise otherwise it's custom and like they know you're there like there's scouts that mm -hmm. are watching but it's custom to show that you're you're coming up to the hold with your face unveiled and um, making noise so that no one thinks that you're trying to surprise them. Right, you're not creeping up on them uh, ready to kill because the veil up means you're ready to kill somebody and not making noise means you might be, you know, they've been raiding each other for centuries. They're all about raids and so you have to sort of show that you're not raiding. Sort of like the tradition of, you know, dofting your cap to show you weren't going to fight because you weren't wearing your helmet, you know, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. There's we have similar things in our culture. Some people say that shaking hands comes from a kind of ancient like checking to make sure there's not a knife up someone's sleeve. It's a way sure. to show there's nothing in your hand. Also, if I'm holding your sword arm, it's kind of going to be hard for you to uh, attack me. Right. You're kind of presenting your strong hand, empty and open. This is my strong. <laughs> you just I don't know how you just made that creepy, but. <laughs> 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 oh, have you, uh, no, that's, a, that's a movie reference. Oh. <laughs> Y'all want some pie? <laughs> oh, also, yeah, Devin brings up the whole reason we shake with our right hand is generally you wipe with your left as well. <laughs> I have heard that also. So be aware. You only, only spread diseases on your right hand and wash. Just, all right, let me rephrase that. Wash your hands, people. <laughs> wash your hands frequently. Just wash your damn hands. Um, Especially in the bathroom. I feel like much like handshakes, this ritual where they, uh, you know, take the any cloth, any covering from their face and, and make a bunch of noise really has turned into something else uh, that I'm sure at some point it was meant to, uh, it, it, I'm sure at one point it had its literal meaning and that was what it was there for. But now it kind of looks more like it sort of turns into a party. Even one of the wise ones is so happy that she's running alongside Bruark and yelling and acting like everyone else. When typically... Well, you, you know, that's Amise, who I believe is... She's happy to see her wife, basically. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and then we see when the our characters enter the hold, there's a there's tons and tons of Aiel in there yelling back. It's, it's like a, a party. It's a big ritual greeting. 
Uh, a parade. Yeah, even. Yeah, that's a better way to put it. Like a conquering, or maybe, or if you've ever seen like the World War II parades, that's sort of what I'm thinking of with the like the tick- ticker tape parade come of these people coming back from going out raiding successfully. Moraine is about to go away, and she gets sort of pulled back into the group of wise ones. And I'm curious if you had any idea what was going on there, because I only have speculation. No, I'm I'm not sure. For some reason, she wants to be near Rand when he enters, but they don't want her to. And I think that could be for a number of reasons. Like, I think it, yeah, I think perhaps she wants to maybe support Rand, and then the wise ones say, no, that's not a good idea. He sh- we should see him. At- standing on his own, not, like, propped up by Aes Sedai. That's my only guess. I think that's part of it, yeah. But but also, I wonder if they feel that Moraine should also have briefing on the cultural things that have to happen. You know, even Rand has had all these lessons, and a lot of them are, like, the correct words to speak at the correct time. So, you know, when they each important member, like Hearn of the Jindo, Ruark, the clan chief... Rand, Kuladin, all these people are there who have to greet Leanne in a very specific way. And we see that it's only like a word or two different when Ruark does it and then Hearn does it. But it's a different greeting that represents their status in society. Right. And and Rand picks the more humble of the greetings when he does his. Right. He uses the same greeting that Hearn does, which is, mm. I assume, like a step down. He's saying, I'm not a clan chief. I'm less, I'm like just a, the most regular kind of leader or something. More like a set chief. Maybe that's what it is. So we do see, or, and when I say maybe that's what it is, maybe it's that the wise ones want Rand to present himself by himself. Yeah. And not to be seen as attached to all these other wetlanders. That, that makes sense. It also kind of struck me, I think this might be in the next chapter, I can't quite remember, or the end of this, I'm not sure, but Ruark addresses Rand in that in a way that kind of gives you the sense that this has been a continuing conversation. He really wants Rand to start dressing like an Aielman, but Rand won't do it. Uh, I think that's that's along a similar line. Like He wants Rand to present himself in such a way that will be acceptable to all these uh, all these other important leaders. Like, he might have Ruark's loyalty, but who else? Hard to say. He's got to do all this stuff right. I'm nodding. This this is one time where I actually was nodding and realized that you can't see me, <laughs> so I actually had to say it again. Okay. So basically, they approach this giant butte that Rand describes as either one giant butte or many all close to each other, or one giant butte that's been, like, fissured and cracked. And Patrick, Patrick, this is a family show. <laughs> Crack kills, and I'm sure that's part of the function of those cracks. <laughs> They're murder holes. <laughs> but <laughs> So as they approach, and then Rand realizes they're entering one of these giant fissures in this huge rock face that they're approaching. And they walk into it, and then they start to walk in the shade, and it curves back and forth. So I'm kind of picking up in the middle here. They rounded another curve, and the fissure opened abruptly into a wide canyon, long and almost straight. From every side, shrill, ululating cries broke from hundreds of women's mouths. A thick crowd lined the way. Women in bulky skirts, shawls wrapped about their heads, and men wearing grayish-brown coats and breeches. The cadence soar. And maidens of the spear, too, waving their arms in welcome, beating on pots or whatever could make a noise. Rand gaped, and not just for the pandemonium. The canyon walls were green. In narrow terraces, climbing halfway up both sides... Not all were really terraces, he realized. Small, flat-roofed houses of gray stone or yellow clay seemed to be stacked practically atop one another, in clusters with paths winding between. And every roof a garden, of beans and squashes, peppers and melons and plants he did not know. Chickens ran loose, redder than those he knew, and some strange sort of fowl, larger and speckled gray. Children, most garbed like their elders, and white-robed Gaishane moved among the rows with big clay pitchers, apparently watering individual plants. The Aiel did not have cities, he had always been told, but this was certainly a fair-sized town at least, if as odd a one as he had ever seen. The din was too great for him to ask any of those questions that popped into his head, such as, what were those round fruits, too red and shiny for apples, growing on low, pale-leaved bushes? 
or those straight, broadleaf stalks lined with long, fat, yellow-tasseled sprouts. He had been too long a farmer not to wonder. Ruark and Hearn slowed, and so did Cooladin, but only to a quick walk, thrusting their spears through their bow-case harnesses on their backs. Amis ran on ahead, laughing like a girl, while the men continued their steady advance along the crowd-lined canyon floor, the cries of the hold's women vibrating in the air and nearly overshadowing the clanging of pots. Rand followed, as Evienda had told him to. Matt looked as if he wanted to turn around and ride right back out again. At the far end of the canyon, the wall leaned inward, making a deep, dark pocket. The sun never reached the back of it, so Avienda had said, and the rocks there, always cool, gave the hold its name. In front of the shadows, Ami stood with another woman atop a wide gray boulder, its top smoothed for a platform. And I thought I cut it off there, but that gives us a lot to talk about. Before we, right before we get into the description of entering, I do want to talk about Kuladin a little bit. Oh, of course, yeah. Because he's running beside them, and we see him sort of look at Rand and get, like, contempt and hatred and amusement, which is different. And Rand notices that that's a different expression, and that's because Asmodian has been hanging out with the Shido and been putting the dragons onto Kuladin's arms. Right. And so now Kuladin has dragons on his arms, and he's basically like, I'm going to show them off and take this and become the Karkarn and take the Aiel away from you. Uh, yes, and I, I, I think, right, and Kuladin knows that. He knows what's about to happen. So, And we also see Asmodian return to the Jindo after spending all the time with the Shido. Mm. So we know he's done with the tattooing. And I think that was all I really wanted to say about him. There was, you said he wanted to add something about, or ask something about the food. Was that in this section? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the, the different kind of plants. Like, so the, we know tomatoes and corn. corn are the two plants that they're growing, very sort of Native American. And, and Aradia brings up a good point that they're using gray water recycling by having things like up on the roof and like they just, all water gets reused mm-hmm. everywhere. They don't waste anything. I thought there was a third plant here. There's a lot more described later, too, while they're eating. And they've got chickens for eggs and fertilization and uh, uh, pest control. Mm. And it looked like what I always assumed was turkeys as well. The uh, the pheasant that Rand describes as bigger than a chicken and, and gray-speckled. I, I just assumed it was a turkey. I don't know that. And if you are from, remember Stormlight, all birds are chickens. So remember it was like water chicken was like a stork. Predator chicken was like a falcon or something like that. I don't remember. Colorful chicken was a parrot. <laughs> Pre- Kelsey's talking about predator chicken like from the Alien movies. But, like, that would be, like, a chicken with another chicken mouth inside of it that when it opened up, the other little smaller chicken mouth came out and snapped. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that kind of predator. I get it now. (laughs) Although I guess if you were strictly going with the predator from the Predator movies, that would be, you know, the sort of four-pointed mouth that opens up in that, you know, big-ass grimace and... Yeah, spider mouth. So you can think about the the chicken's beak doing that uh, with the, like the tongue mouth. inside, splitting oh, into God. like four pieces, and like becoming the ends of hooks. <laughs> Predator chicken. Oh God, that's so creepy. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you need to eat your eggs, guys. They're good for you. Also, you don't want to know what hatches out of the eggs if you don't eat them. They keep down the chicken population. <laughs> Trust me. Eat the eggs. The alternative is not good for anybody. Fire Phoenix just posted a picture of the moray eel uh, kind of mouth structure and how there is a mouth inside of its mouth. That's That was the inspiration for the alien creature. Yeah, because what it is is they like they use the outer mouth to like clamp onto prey and then the inner mouth to draw it oh, back into the... Oh. Um, yeah, really pretty terrifying. So just imagine that on a chicken. And, you know, I mean... Terrifying. uh, If it could be on an eel, it could be on a dinosaur. So just imagine (laughs) perhaps a 12-foot chicken with one of those. 
Why did it have to be a spider? <laughs> wow. That's so cool. And it's like an x-ray gift, so you can see all the internal workings of the jaw. That's so cool. Oh, my God. Now she found a gif of <laughs> the mouth inside of a mouth eating a spider. <laughs> it's horrifying. <laughs> That is really cool. And that mouth goes, like, way back into its stomach. It, like, drags the thing all the way down. All right. But to move us forward from giant scary chickens. (laughs) (laughs) And spiders and moray eels and terrible, terrible singing. (laughs) The whole next two pages is the greeting ritual. Which I don't feel like we really have to read. I think we can sum it up in that, like, yeah, you know, we get a normal sort of sub clan chief greeting. We get a normal clan chief greeting. Then Kuladin walks in and does his like, "I'm a clan chief" because he knows he's got the fucking tattoos on he his arms, greets. but he hasn't proven that to anybody. Yeah, and the the kind of I wanted to point out, I forgot to say this, that the it looks like the stone platform at the beginning of the at the entrance to the hold where it looks like Amis and Lien are standing, Roof Mistress and Wise One are greeting everyone kind of as they come in or they are greeted by everyone who comes in. And just like you said, Ruark says, I ask leave to enter your hold. And, you know, his wife is like, you always have my leave, babe. And (laughs) Rand's like, that didn't seem formal. But he doesn't he doesn't realize that he's married to both of those women yet, you know? (laughs) He like smacks her ass as he walks by. He's like, That's not fair. Is that formal greeting? Do I do I do that? No, no. (laughs) I mean there's like do not smack her ass. Ruark does do do the traditional greeting, but his wife gives him a sort of the traditional greeting and then a non traditional afterward. And then Hearn, Mm -hmm. who's a sep chief does a slightly different one. I I couldn't really find a straight explanation other than it was just two different, uh, they were different status, essentially. Yeah, so Ruark says, I ask leave to enter your hold, Roof Mistress, he announces. And Hearn says, Roof Mistress, I ask leave to come beneath your roof. I mean, it's the same sentence virtually, but it's the order of the words is different. And Mm -hmm. it's just a slightly different sentence. And there's... Well, coming beneath your roof versus entering your hold. And that seems to be, can I, like, come in for some shelter versus, like, hey, can I, like, put my feet up and make myself comfortable? Yeah. And then, of course, Kuladin says exactly what Ruark said. And Leanne, the roof mistress of Cold Rock's hold, like, hesitates and... I love her comeback. Leanne blinked, frowning at him. And we get a, some really rapidly whispered lines from Avienda into Rand's ear. And Rand says, what's the matter? Why, does, why isn't she saying something to him, too? And Avienda says, basically, like, he asked as if he were a clan chief. He's crazy. Because if she refuses him, and this is Avienda explaining it, but in my words, if she refuses cool an entry, she could cause a, a, like a battle with the, the, all the Shido that are camped outside. You can't just disrespect like that and say no you can't come in here like get out if she accepts then she acknowledges him as a clan chief so what she does is she accepts in the traditional manner that you would accept a like a dying person that that wandered close to your house a beggar is i think the word they use yeah she gives him the beggar's greeting so like yes you may enter but as a as a clanless beggar yeah yeah, and it isolates him, in, and it cuts him off from his clan in saying that, like, yeah, you are just worthless. It's not that your clan's worthless. I'm, I, you know, I'm letting ever, I'm welcoming you and your clan, but I'm not welcoming you as a clan chief. You, you are a beggar. Yeah, and it's perfect because I mean, he's not even, he's not anything. He's not a sep chief. He's not a clan chief. He's just a regular soldier, really. But he's. He's taking up. He's trying to take up his brother's mantle now that his brother's dead. But you have to go through a whole th- series of things to do that. And he's doing the bully thing, which is he has this. He has a secret. He knows he's got the tattoos on his arms, and so he's baiting everyone into 
not treating him well so that when he can whip out his tattoos and be like, ha ha, you were, you know, you're stupid. You didn't know I had these tattoos the whole time. You should have been treating me like a clan chief. Like, it's such a, a, a despicable thing to be doing. He knows they think he's not a clan chief. And he's just being a prick about it. Yeah. So, so that now uh, when they have to slight him, basically, he can he can punish them later. He'll have a reason to exactly. He'll have a reason to like they weren't nice to me when they when I was a clan chief, you know. And it's like, well, but they, there's no way you they, they they couldn't have known. There's no possible way they could have known. Yeah. So that's my that's you know my first take on Kuludin is he's a, he's a bully and a dick. Yep. Uh, which I think everyone pretty yeah. much agrees with. So <laughs> he's very hateable person. Yeah, he's like always angry. And um, I did really like uh, at after Leanne says, I just want to find the exact line. Oh, this is after she's Leanne says, "You have my leave." Leanne began. Cool it and smiled, swelling up where he stood. To step beneath my roof, water and shade will be found for you. S- Soft oh. gasps from hundreds of mouths made it quite a loud sound. And I, I just really liked that in between there because Avienda's kind of like chittering very quickly in Rand's ear as things are happening in front of him to try to explain to him so he can understand what's happening, you know? And at some point she says she could have refused Ruark, who's the chief of the clan, to entry, first of all. So, and she could even refuse he who comes with the dawn. And then she says, women are not powerless among us, not like your wetlander women, who must be queens or nobles, else dance for a man if they wish to eat. He shook his head slightly. Every time he was on the point of berating himself for how little he had learned about the Aiel, Avienda reminded him how little she knew about anyone not Aiel. <laughs> and then he's, he kind of pulls the women's circle card again, where... He says, someday I'd like to introduce you to the women's circle in Emmons Field. It will be interesting to hear you explain to them how powerless they are. Yeah, I think Avienda actually eventually gets over that when like, she's dealing with the kin and the sea folk and all those folks. She's like, yeah, I get it. Okay, Wetlander people are assholes too. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me a lot of the, oh, I wish Rand were here, he's good with girls trope. In that, like... Every single one of the women think that, like, other women are powerless. Yeah, yeah. Or if that, that makes sense. And they, like, they're always like, oh, well, at least I don't, I'm not powerless like that group of women. You know, the sea folk certainly think all the, the drylanders? What do they call them? The shorebound. Shore yeah. uh, the shorebound. <laughs> <laughs> the drylanders. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you know, their women are weak, and because they don't, like, they're not free on the ocean, and they... You know, we're yeah, tops. and we we always see this kind of, and this is true in the absolutely true in the real world too. But I love this. With, there's a kind of cultural exceptionalism, for lack of a better term. Everyone thinks wherever they come from came mm-hmm. from is the best place, right? Or everyone thinks, yeah, which is silly because we, we mine is out. clearly better. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what yeah, they're talking obviously about. Obviously, we're the ones that have it all figured. <laughs> obviously, out. everyone else is wrong. <laughs> I kind of wanted to continue here. I forgot this part too. Avienda goes on to explain a little more. She has welcomed him, but in quotes, as one of as one friendless and alone. Avienda whispered, "She has welcomed him as a beggar, the gravest insult to him, and none to the Shido." Which means that not only did she welcome Ru- or uh, welcome Kuladin as a as a beggar, she did not welcome all the the warriors that are outside. Right. Because they're not represented, and I feel like I kind of want to point this out too, they're not represented by any chief or leader. They're a leaderless group of warriors. That's Yeah, because the last guy they sent on to Ruidian dug his own eyes out of right. his face. Yeah. <laughs> and that's an inherently threatening thing. You, you're bringing an army onto this territory and there's not even anyone to talk to. Like, there's no leader to speak with about this. That's, you know... And this is where we, we start to get the first mentions of Savannah. Savannah. Yes. And her leadership, sort of where she takes the Shido. You know, she's she's around and she's married to Kuladin, but she's not really talked about until he dies. But she is she's ready to spring up and do some awful, awful things with the Shido. 
And she comes up because she will be leading the contingent of Shido to Alcar Dal because there is no clan chief currently. And she is an important roof mistress and the wife of the chief of the clan. And Kuladin has like half the sept with him at Ruidian, and she's got the other half at their sept and their hold. So they're sort of meeting in the middle. Right. And then they're heading to the Golden Bowl. Well, not quite yet, but uh, they, they'll leave early and head to the Golden Bowl. I like how Matt says, watch your back with that one. I'm like, no, Matt's going to watch his back with that one. Yeah. <laughs> going to put Nash and Darai through that ass hat. <laughs> Ash and Hat and Darai. Ash, Ash and Darai. Ash, Hat and Darai. There we go. Ass and Darai. <laughs> Ass and Darai. Yeah, that, that's the one. That's that's what I was going for. Thank you, Aradia. <laughs> See, we knew you kept kept you around for some reason. Okay, and then so so Rand does his greeting, and he does a sept chief greeting, which we mm-hmm. talked about. I ask leave to which come is to humble, and he gets the yeah yeah yeah. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> and the roof mistress is also annoyed by this because he's doing it wrong, just like Kuladin. But at least she looked questioningly at Amis, who nodded, and then she says. Such modesty, Leanne said slowly, is becoming in a man. Men seldom know where to find it. Spreading her dark skirts, she curtsied awkwardly. It was not a thing Aiel women did. Oh, Rand bowed. I forgot to mention that, which is not part of the thing, but it doesn't mess it up either. But still a curtsy, in return of his bow. The Karakaran has leave to enter my hold. For the chief of chiefs, there is ever water and shade at cold rocks. Another great uulation rose from the women in the crowd. But whether for him or the ceremony, Rand did not know. I feel like, yeah, RJ's trying to summon, like, the, the kind of, oh, gosh, this is going to be tough to navigate. But I feel like there's a kind of Middle Eastern thing that women women do in that region that's similar, and but only the women do it. A uulation. It's like a, a celebration sound. And I guess with that, I just wanted to point out that even though Rand did the greeting improperly, Leanne acknowledged him as the Karakarn anyway, in front of this great group, this large group of people, which is important. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Kelsey. Zena and Gabri- Gabrielle. They always do the, you, yeah, oh, yeah. The sound. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. When she throws the damn. And Kevin Sorbo as Hercules. Oh, God. <laughs> I still hear it. I hear it in my head. <laughs> oh, my God. That took me back. That, like, you said that, and that dropped me into my living room in the 90s. I can picture the couch. I can picture the wood trim. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I used to watch that show. I used to watch those shows, Xena and Hercules, on a TV that had carved wooden feet. Just to date that. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, it was my grandparents' TV that they probably bought in 1960, but they still had it, you know, 35 years later or whatever. You got up to turn the dial. Click, 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 click. Channel 13. Sweet. Yeah. Oh, there was a remote, but it did literally make a clicking oh, sound. Okay. <laughs> You'd pick it up and it would like click, click, and then the channel would slowly change. <laughs> <laughs> You turn it on. Wom. Yeah, I, I so wish. I wasn't there, but uh, they eventually got rid of it. But I had so wished to just keep the frame of it, you know? <laughs> Put like a flat yeah. screen in there. It's so Make classy. It. <laughs> I will say we had the best room it was it was like an add-on to the house at one point that had so they'd put down a brick floor and it had one of those hot water heating systems in the floor oh cool and then it was all windows so it was like because it was add on an add on it was a turret so it was like almost a i would say it was like 300 degrees of windows and then the tv was against the you know what used to be the exterior wall oh, that sounds beautiful and then so in the summer, like, you could sit there, uh, or just in the winter, the heat would be on, and it was just, like, beautifully warm, and the light would shine in, and uh, I'd watch really, really, really terrible <laughs> TV. Uh, that, I remember there's a lot of Voyager watched on that couch. Um, uh, the UPN network, was that the one? 
Sequest. Oh, fuck. I loved Sequest. Uh, Earth 2. Anyone else? Earth 2, anybody? That picture I just posted looked almost exactly like my grandparents' TV. And that little panel on the side opens like it's a wooden door and the buttons are underneath it. Nice. <laughs> so classy. Yeah, right, Kelsey? Drawers. Why'd they put drawers in there? I don't know. <laughs> but it sure does look good. <laughs> you have met my wife, Amis, Ruark said to Rand. Now you must meet my wife, Leanne. <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> Both of them? <laughs> Matt spluttered. <laughs> He's he's the luckiest man in the world or the biggest fool since creation, is what Matt says. <laughs> That's pretty much my reaction whenever I talk to somebody who says they're dating multiple people. I'm always just like, wow, you're either awesome or crazy. I'm not sure which one, maybe both. That's, about all I, that's all I got. Well, maybe, you know, it's just like brave and stupid. What's the difference? It's often hard to say. <sighs> I don't I I don't have the time, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'd like to date one person first. That's a good start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm working working on that one. By the way, if you're coming to Jordan Con <laughs> <laughs> Shameless singles play. Listen, I've tried Tinder, it sucks, okay? I'm <laughs> I'm trying the Jordan Con app now. Jordan Con app. Over the next page, I don't really have very much other than I totally understood why you would milk Agara. <laughs> uh, I would assume it was for an antidote. Oh, I assumed it was for the poison <laughs> to to put on arrows or a knife. Uh, you know, both both could be true. Yeah, that 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 could do. But I was th- I was thinking anti venom that like the way the reason you milk a snake and the reason you would milk a poisonous toad with fangs to me would be the same is that you would um want to use develop an yeah. venom. Rand's like, how do you milk a lizard? I don't get it. Very carefully. That's how you milk it. Very, very carefully. And that's just kind of Ruar kind of makes fun of Avienda because Rand and Matt don't seem to understand that it's possible to for a man to be married to two women when it's such a like kind of normal thing in Aeol society. And there are certainly societies, human societies, where that has been common. Especially warrior societies where a lot of the men die. They did. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing. They've, they've been raiding each other and fighting each other and stabbing each other for a long time. And, and although the women do fight, more of the men fight. And so you're going to have a mismatch between the number of men and women. And that's going to encourage polyamory. Is my sort of assumption is how uh, Jordan was building that society. In his head. They go into Leanne and Leanne's house where Ruark is allowed <laughs> because he is her husband. I'd also like to point out that this is sort of what I feel like the blossoming of Rand and Avienda's relationship. And so we get a few little hints just to keep track of through the chapter. One where he like requests to keep her, which is sort of him acknowledging that he actually wants Avienda near him for the yeah. first time. And then he goes out and in the next chapter we see him like buy the bracelet and give that to her. And I mean, this this is whole cascading effect that results in the maidens essentially being his bodyguards and everything that that results from that. So you know, this is. I didn't realize that it happened so quickly until I read back through this these two chapters, the kind of loyalty coming from the maidens. Or they they like him right away. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I agree that Aradia, I'm not really sure exactly what his feelings are, but for the first time, he, like, he's, when someone says, hey, we're going to take this woman away, he's like, no, oh, no, 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 I want her to stay. You know, he, he, he needs some. he's very confused, obviously, but he needs someone who's going to take him seriously and treat him like a, a person and not like the Karakarn or like the dragon reborn or like uh, the enemy. Yeah. I think, I think the conversation you're referring to happens in the next chapter, but I was, um, sort of putting together a couple of these conversations into one sort oh, of yeah. thread. Cause it's sort of like, it's dropped in here or there. It's sort of hard to talk about, uh, all in one. Cause it's like this little like pattern and thread in the pattern that keeps right. popping up. 
I was I was really eager to point out that I th- I think that when Melaine is cut off by Amis, I think, and she's in the middle of saying like, "If I had to, I would lay the whatever myself," but she gets cut off. You, you don't hear the end. I think that she yeah. was, she means to say, "If I could, I would lay the bridal wreath myself." Yes, for Avienda, yeah. because that's what they want to happen. <laughs> that's what these older women actually want to happen. Their goal is to get him to fall in love with Avienda and Avienda fall in love with him and have them marry. So he has, so he cares for the Aiel people as a people and not just powerful, a beautiful warrior woman who are about to train into a wise one, which would be a good match for Akara Karn, who is a you know tall, good looking, and accomplished warrior himself. Like no reason Avienda would really have to not like him. So let's force them together and. And, you know, they're from the same tribe, so they may be related, and we can get our incest vibes out, because apparently that's something we do in fiction now. We force them together, and they have to endure all these hardships together. They'll gr- then grow close. And then it will soon, I, I think what the, they're thinking is that it will soon come to pass that Avienda and Rand won't want to spend, won't want to not spend time with each other. We won't be able to separate them if we keep at this. That's, I think, the goal. Sorry to ramble on forever about it, but no, totally. I, I'm I'm right there behind you. You're. It's exactly something that right. I didn't really feel like I understood until recently, but I think that's their intent. I, I think that this slip of the tongue is probably the most clear cut evidence for what they actually want. You know, they're not really trying. They they yeah sure she's there as a spy kinda, but not really. No, and there's plenty of other ways for them to spy on him. They don't need to sick one girl to follow him around all day. That's Firefox says she's a honey trap. <laughs> yeah, basically. yeah, except there's, but like, but not like a dishonest one. You know, they're like, yeah, here's a pretty girl, love her. And Rand's like, she's reporting back, right? And they're like, yep. <laughs> not really a spy when it's that out in the open. Yeah, <laughs> it's not spying. Wise ones don't spy. She may be a honey trap fire Shifty phoenix, eyes. but there's like some chili pepper in there. I don't know if that wasn't a very good analogy, but <laughs> she is not all honey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I I think the rose and thorns is probably a uh, better totally. analogy. Perhaps a, 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 a Venus fly trap. But yeah, the rose and thorns gift that Rand gives her, I think, is really appropriate. But that's the next chapter. There's the exchange of gifts that happens as they enter Leanne's home. I'll we'll probably go brush over that i skipped over most all that yeah the one thing i want to talk about when they get into the door there's some shara rugs which i thought was kind of cool that they, mm-hmm. there's like because they're at this crossroads of cultures they have a mix of all sorts of different cultures and places and things that have come to them through trade and conquest in some cases Yes, in many, 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 many cases. <laughs> in <laughs> most cases. And gives Leanne the golden lion, That's this beautifully carved golden lion from Taran goldsmiths who are apparently really good at what they do. Leanne's like, oh, I love it. After the Aiel War, Ruark brought me two of these. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I had uh, something in particular to say about that because... You took them from the tent of a high lord just before Layman was beheaded, didn't you? Did you not? Mm-hmm. I feel like that's a pretty important line because that, A, tells us that Layman was beheaded, first of all, not killed in battle. Right. So he was taken by the Aiel and beheaded. So no one, you know, s- struck him down in the heat of a fight. And second of all, we know the Aiel did it. Yeah, I, and I thought it, it was a, f- a kind of a fun little world building factoid that Ruark was probably like right there. Like he was in the heat of the battle. He wasn't on the outskirts. He wasn't off doing something else. He was like, yeah. Right. And, you know, knowing his station, he may have even been commanding the battle. Right. And Arady makes a good point. We also know that, that Ruark didn't kill Layman because he was off killing a different noble. However, it might make sense that the head of Ruark's clan at the time may have killed him because he would have been near the head of his clan, right? That's right. Ruark was a Sept chief until fairly recently. Mm-hmm. And he was a Sept chief under... Oh, I forget his... I forget who the last... Ja- Janduin? Janduin. 
Ojandawin Rand's father. Yep. So what I'm thinking is Rand's dad is the one who beheaded Layman. Awesome. <laughs> and I feel like this is pretty decent evidence for it because we know that Ruark was right there. Ruark would have been with his clan. His clan was headed by Rand's father. Rand's father would have been the one to behead Layman because he would have been taken taken prisoner and executed by the the head of the clan that took him. That's my theory. That's my my proof for that. Yeah, and if like right when Layman is getting be- beheaded, Ruark is running through some Terran High Lord's camp, like killing people and stealing their stuff, then stealing isn't the right word, but you guys know what I mean. Then we we I think I just also found it interesting to kind of note that Ruark would have been in the most important place. Like he was killing the leaders, not the soldiers. Like he wasn't, you know, you know what I'm saying? Mm, yeah, A exactly. Taran High Lord exactly. would have been right there next to King Lom and likely, or their camps would have been near each other. And perhaps at almost the exact same time, Rand was being born. Do you think Layman was executed in the same moment that Rand was born? Real close. If not that day that day then you know or if if not that hour i should say then then right before or after so cuz i mean just i believe that we get word uh, so i'm going back to new spring here cuz th- we actually see the day when that happens right so oh, yeah. um if i remember correctly we get news moraine gets news of layman's death the same day as the prophecy. I just so, but the news probably comes by pigeon. So it, you know, it probably happens before his birth, but it's gonna be pretty damn close. Well, I mean, it would be really the because the final battle, the or the battle at the Shining Walls. Mm-hmm. There, that would have ended once the news of Layman's death and the Aiel yeah, retreat. Because once Layman died, the Aiel just leave. So yeah, it could very well have been like in the same hour. I think so. Oh, yeah, I, I think that I agree with Aradia saying that news of Layman's death would travel faster than regular mail. But they're like, you know, I don't know exactly how close to the Battle of the Shining Walls actually got to the walls. But if it's named after the walls of Tarvalon, then they're like yeah. s- shouting distance <laughs> almost from the tower. I like Metal Datura's theory that once... Rand is basically, once his mother is there on the mountain and he's ready to be born, there's no need for Layman to be alive anymore because the Aiel don't need to be there there anymore. So the pattern oh, kills shit. him. Yeah, I like that a lot. I'm glad he caught that I didn't see that. Yeah. In any case. I noticed that when they greet land they call when uh, he's called Annaline, they greet his, like, their whole demeanor towards him changes. Yes. At first, it almost looks like one of the wise ones is going to tell him to put that dumb sword outside, but they don't. That weapon's for only for death. But yeah, I mean, he's it's I I the Aiel respect for Aniline is an interesting thing, and and again, this was obviously long before New Spring came out. But here's a hint to it, and we know that you know back then when they heard his name, and then they do mention that in the Eye of the World that went once. They heard his name. They they left yeah. him alone when they could have killed him, which is sort of a – I never really got an answer for that other than perhaps the wise one prophecy. That would make perfect sense or that, that would make all that work. All right. So Fire Phoenix says Rand was born on the last day of the blood so- snow, 970E, 978, and Layman is killed on the third day of the Battle of the Shining Walls. So do we know how many days – Battle of the Shining Walls went? Was it just three days? Mm. Because in that case, it would be the Is same the day. Is the Blood Snow and the Battle of the Shining Walls two different battles? Because they're really close together. It's oh, the same okay. one. It's, called, yeah, that's just different yeah, names. They just the have different battle. names. Mm-hmm. Because the I, it, it would stand to reason that, you know, with armies in the hundreds of thousands fighting each other at just outside Tarvalin, that a lot of that fighting would spill over on, onto the slopes of Dragon Mount and, you know, the edge of it. Because they're that's just they're so close together. Uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm just more and more the evidence appears to be piling up that those events, if not exactly the same moment, were certainly the same day. Or one right after the other. I even I almost like even yeah. more that one happened, so the next thing happens, and so on. You know, there's the greetings and gifts, and 
The only thing of note is that when Moraine tries to give Leanne a gift and she goes last, Leanne won't accept it because she's Aes Sedai, but she does accept a gift from the Kara Karn. <laughs> yeah. Well, and part of the – she has a lot of respect for the Aes Sedai because she hasn't seen the past. She never went through – she's not. She's a roof mistress, not a wise one, so she hasn't seen the images of her ancestors. So she doesn't know exactly what the Aiel – obligation to the Aes Sedai is mm-hmm. then that like on the next page that <clears throat> Rand awkwardly trying to eat while laying down which is something the Aiel traditionally do and Rand and Matt are kind of struggle with it real time follow up Fire Phoenix is brilliant she's uh, quoting the big white book and it says the battle of the shining walls lasted three days Laman was killed on the third day and we know Rand was born on the last day total confirmation same day Hours. And so we know that when Juan and so when Juandwin was off killing Layman, literally when Juandwin was killing Layman, his father was killing Layman while he was being born. And the guilt of that is what sent Juandwin I'm sorry if I'm saying his name correctly, off into Janduin, off into the waste to be killed by Tigraine's brother his wife's brother, who had at that point become Slayer. Circle of Lie. <laughs> Circle of death, more like. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's it's Luke. Luke is the one who's uh, in possession of the body because Janduin won't raise his spear to protect himself because it looks just like his wife, a.k.a. Rand's mom. Yeah, he obviously he gave up being clan chief to go off into the blight to fight. Yeah, he wanted to die is basically what that means. Uh, they eat. Oh, yeah, so here's the, uh, the next one is the food, the food scene where... We could sit around, and I'm actually really hungry, so if you could you could read this quickly. It looks yeah, really tasty. crumbly, coarse yellow bread. Cornbread, right? Mm, cornbread, um, yep. Bright red beans mixed with the green. I don't know what that is. What are... I think they're just peppers. Like long peppers? Bell peppers. So like... Yeah, like long bell peppers. Maybe spicy peppers ones. peppers all put together in different colors. And then a dish of bright yellow kernels and bits of pulpy red that Avia Enda called zamai or tamat tomatoes or zamai is isn't that basically maize so, yeah so i think this is almost like a take on pico de gallo or something mm. this like dish of chopped vegetables all together the tomato and corn and maybe something else so yeah metal de Toro was saying succotash the one thing i couldn't figure out a bulbous sweet fruit with a tough greenish skin that came from one of those leafless spiny plants called cardum i don't i i assumed that these are they're like sections of cactus the they even sell them in in some grocery stores now in the states where it's pretty common in in the southwest of the country you'll see this a lot it's the the type of cactus that has the big flat kind of mitt shaped pieces that all grow one from the next you know what i mean and if you just shave off the the thorns yes that thank you fire phoenix if you just shave off the thorns, you can skin them and fry them up, and they're kind of lemony. You can you can eat the leaves, for lack of a better term, as well as the fruit that grows from the top. But that's a that prickly pear is like a super sweet, bright purple color. But just the leaves are like a lemony kind of pulpy thing that is tasty. Cool. I didn't know that. I was thinking it was what's the the round things with the papery skin that you mash up to make like a salsa. Avocado? No, not an avocado. Tomatillo, yes. Oh, yeah. Do you think... Uh, that's what I was says, wondering. If these were um, a bulbous fruit with tough greenish skin would be a uh, tomatillo. Might be. I'm also no? going to um, Google the word cardon because sometimes RJ gives us little clues. Mm-hmm. Like when he calls cotton el goad, and, which is actually cotton in another language. But but you're right, the description of the plant doesn't match the tomatillo plant. So, oh, Radio thinks it's kind of squash. That could be it, too. But how do you how do you get, what kind of squash doesn't have, has a leafless plant? Leafless, spiny plants. Yeah, that's that's what I'm stuck on is like, I don't, I didn't know any leafless, spiny plants, but if the cactus pod seemed to be the answer, this is the research phase of the podcast. It's fun to see it through Rand's, though, like the eyes of an outsider. Rand's eyes. He's never seen any of this stuff before. 
So, but but a lot of it is real. RJ gives us real things to kind of discover. You know, it's fun to figure it out. Oh, the next thing I have is Ran thinking about sister wives as he sits and eats with everyone, and Ran could not see Elaine and Min agreeing to such an agreement. He wondered why he had even thought of it. The sun must have cooked his brains. <laughs> Boy, you should skip forward a few books, because uh, guess what? You're getting married. Thrice. <laughs> thrice thrice over. Enjoy. Uh, which, of course, goes right back to Matt's comment earlier. Light. I don't know if he's the luckiest man or... <laughs> what was, what the was dumbest it? man since creation or something <laughs> like that. The luckiest man in the world or the biggest fool yeah. since creation. <laughs> I feel like that applies to uh, Rand's love square. That's a good question, Kelsey. Rand does think about men quite a bit, especially when he I, he's frustrated with other women. He always tends to go back to like, boy, I wish that Min was here. Like, I just feel regular when she's with me. She's his comfort. And so he, it's like, you know, when you go home, you you get stew. When he goes home, he gets Min. That's sort of his, like... <laughs> and I think we've talked about this before, about how Min kind of represents home, you know? Or or at least the Two Rivers part of yeah. the land. The part of him that grew up there and, and you know, the, the one who sits and remembers a shepherd named Randolph Thor while cut to shreds on a bed, bleeding. You know, that's the Rand he get, that gets to come out. And that's the, you know, as opposed to... Be himself. The ruler... Rand, who's the, the the Andoran king, who is you know inheriting a nobility and a and a her- uh, a bearing that you can see in his face, or the Aiel, the Aiel savage, the culture savage that he gets from his culture and his like. I don't even know if savage is right, but his uh, I'd almost say his calm and his fatal not fatality but fatalistic attitude. Uh, he gets a little bit of that mm-hmm. from the Aiel. And, you know, his, yeah, his warrior culture that, that goes really well with Avienda. Oh, Fire Phoenix. So if you spell Cardon with a C rather than a K, <laughs> you will find this type of cactus, which is real and seems to grow bulbous pods. Can you eat it, though, Fire Phoenix? Can you eat Cardon? Fire Phoenix has been a Google wizard tonight. Google wizard. And she says, yep. Uh, sorry, Google I said I. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think she wins the brown Aja contest tonight for research. Okay, the Cardin cactus also comes from the same region in Mexico where where corn originated, or the same region of the world. Oh, Robert Jordan, you clever son of a bitch! <laughs> of course, he <laughs> researches the exact plants that would be able to grow in this climate and figures out how they'd work together and has them all growing in one place. He read way too many books, by the way. That's I think I think that's really Robert Jordan's issue is uh, he just read so many books and he wanted to put all the details. This article I'm reading does not say that it's edible, and it even says it might be psychoactive. <laughs> but in the Wheel of Time, peaches are poisonous. So although they still exist, they've changed in such a way that now they can't be eaten. So maybe the opposite could have happened here. This other article says it is edible. The flowers are very similar to those of a ceguello, but with more and narrower tepals. The ovid fruits are densely covered with leafy areoles. On different plants, they range from spineless to very long spiny. The juicy pulp of ripe fruit... Uh, I'm not... Cardon fruit was an important food for the Siri people in Sonora, who called the cactus x-a-a-s-j which i am not going to try and pronounce <laughs> hasa or something like that the flesh of this cactus contains alkaloids mm-hmm. it may have been used as a psycho- tr- psychoactive plant in mexico the next thing that i really have is basically ruark answering some of Rand's questions like how many clans do you think will follow me and ruark tries to give a breakdown he's like four definitely four maybe <laughs> and he's like the rest i don't know I, I want to. There's a little bit with Avienda I want to talk about first. She, he basically says, "Hey, if you hate being my teacher, I'm not going to make you do it. Like you can say no." And she looks at him and she says, "You've done nothing to me, 
and you never will. And she sort of bares her teeth at him. And I think that is, again, referencing her visions on her accepted test is her basically saying, like, I saw in the future that I fall for you and I'm not giving into that because I was going to protect you. For Elaine? For Elaine, yeah. And so, like, this this whole – that's that's her whole problem with her toe is, like, she sees in the future that, like, she's going to have to sleep with him or fall in love with him, basically. I don't know, sleep with him, but fall in love with him. And she's really angry about that. And so – but that anger then spurns him to say immediately after there, maybe he gave her a gift. She'll stop being so mean. So her anger about falling in love spurs him to get the gift – that makes everyone think that they're trying to get together, which does that thing. You know, it, like it's that whole self-fulfilling prophecy of like, would they have fallen in right. love if she hadn't been angry at him for the fact that she was going to fall in love with him? Uh, because I just I see that chain of causality from like anger to he's trying to pacify the anger. So he buys her gift. The gift is the first thing that really has them yeah. and has the the. Uh, the courting being taken seriously. And he buys a gift from the maiden and tells her that he wants to give it to Av- Avienda, but he doesn't say why. And she, and she goes, oh, yes. And then she refused payment, refuses payment even. Yeah. No, oh, you can have that. You can, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yes. And then they do this elaborate tea sipping ceremony, and Rand has no idea what that means. But later Avienda tells us that means that all of the maidens there approve of the match and are backing Rand <laughs> essentially to be like, we will help you court her. Yep. Basically. And now, and now she's like, Oh, and now you have to court me because if you say you're not courting me, I'll be so embarrassed that like, <laughs> Oh my God, what have yeah. you done? Arady just said an army of wing women, which is yeah. exactly what happened. Literal army. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, for a second, I thought they were going to do Usquai, but that's later. When they when they all take he sips of Usquai and they get him real drunk and take off his pants. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> so yeah, then the next part is Ruark sort of yeah. Plan. It kind of starts when Rand hears that the Goshen and Sharad are going to be the first to arrive at Alcair Dal, and then Rand says, "Don't those two have a blood feud? Like, what if what if they start killing each other?" And Ruark's like, "Well, there's you know Alcair Dal Dal is a lot like." Ruidian, it has similar rules that govern how people can act. And Rand's like, well, I saw how the Shido acted when being guided by those rules. And everybody's like briefly, slightly offended. They're like, no, 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 no. The Goshen are not the Shido, Mulane said sharply. And so all that happens. He's being like briefed on all this, you know. You really see the Shido being treated differently. And I wonder how much of that contributes to their, like, you know, again, we just talked about self-fulfilling prophecies. But how much is it like... Are the Shido dicks because they're treated differently, or are they treated differently because they're dicks? I mean, I'm sure it is a little bit cyclical, but yeah, it is. And I feel like there's the Shido leaders, at least, seem to be just terrible at humbling themselves in, in any any circumstance. And so it's not terribly surprising, where especially in Aiel culture, where, where that is a really important thing to do under certain circumstances. You have to be admit that you're wrong and made a mistake sometimes, and then... You, like, get with the right people and figure out how to fix it. It's a very set-out system. And if you don't do it right, people get upset. I also sort of feel like this is a continuation of the vision where we see various groups of people sort of peeling off the Aiel and either becoming their own group or simply being extinguished. And this is just another group that we sort of see come to a difference in terms of, like, how are we going to treat the way of the leaf and how are we going to treat our culture? And essentially they pervert it into making guys shine slaves and, you know, taking the fifth means they get to take whatever they want. And like, they basically, you know, pervert the way of the leaf and the culture of the Aiel into their own greedy desires. But it's just sort of another, just like the Tuathuan split off because they didn't want to carry the Terang Rial anymore. Right. And they took a different way. The Shido are taking it a different way. It's just, you know, it's a <laughs> shitty way. And it's just sort of proof that, like, if you don't come together, the wise ones sort of are the people who use prophecy and visions to keep the I.O. people going forward and alive and um, united. You know, I, I feel like they would have been wiped out long ago if it wasn't for the the visions of the, of the wise ones. 
and and basically what happens is you stop you know the 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 Shido stop following the visions laid out by the Aes Sedai and sacrifice themselves because they don't send anyone through the they don't have a real clan chief and so they, that's where they go astray is they don't have anyone who actually understands yes. the truth and we see that later like in the very end like towards the end of the series we see Savannah like totally misinterpreting shit because she doesn't she never went through the the so she columns so she just doesn't know and does not believe you know i guess she's probably heard it because ran says it but most of the shido just don't believe they just, they're like well no i mean clearly kuladin was the car car and he's dead now so that's not what happened and yes and then ruark just kind of gives rand a rundown when he says like how many how many do you think will follow me and rand says well i don't really know and he just starts running through the list and saying like well this guy and this guy will this guy, I don't know, he's a little Han of the Tum and L, may move in any direction. He's a prickly man, hard to know and difficult to deal with. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did notice when he said there's no way to imitate the dragon's Ruidian, Moraine's oh, eyes yeah. flicker. And she's like, mm, maybe with the power, maybe with the power. That's definitely a little foreshadowing there. Totally. It's definitely foreshadowing. And from there, I pretty much just have readout. Also makes me wonder if Moraine has something to do with the dragon. <laughs> I feel like that is a red herring there, though. That that has to be, yeah. Or just maybe that she's, she, like, realizes that the Forsaken are with them. I think she is actually clued in enough to figure that one out. I think she's figured out, eh, maybe not till after he captures Asmodian. I could be wrong about that. Yeah, I think I'm wrong about that. She she does figure out that Asmodian's with Rand, but that's after he's yeah. been captured and training him for a while. Then she understands. So right now, no, she wouldn't know. So I think she just understands that it could be done with the power. As I was saying, Ruark said, frowning resignedly from one of his wives to the other, it is not a thing I can be sure of. Most will follow you. Perhaps all. Perhaps even the Shido. We have waited 3,000 years for the man who bears two dragons. When you show your arms, none will doubt you are the one sent to unite us and break them. But he did not mention that. The question is how they will decide to react. He tapped his teeth with his pipe stem for a moment. You will not change your mind and don the Caden sore? And show them what, Ruark? A pretend Aiel? As well dress Matt for an Aiel, Matt choked on his pipe. I will not pretend. I am what I am. They must take me as I am. Rand raised his fists, coat sleeves falling enough to co- uncover the golden maned heads on the backs of his wrists. These prove me. If they aren't enough, then nothing is. Where do you mean to lead the spears to war once more? Moraine asked suddenly and Matt choked again, snatching the pipe out of his mouth and staring at her. Her dark eyes were not lidded any longer. Rand's fist tightened convulsively, till his knuckles cracked. Trying to be clever with her was dangerous. He should have learned that long since. She remembered every word that he, that she heard, filed it away, sorted and examined it until she knew just what it meant. He got to his feet slowly. They were all watching him. Egwene frowned even more worriedly than Matt, but the Aiel just watched. Talk of war did not upset them. Ruark looked ready, and Moraine's face was all frozen calm. If he'll excuse me, he said, I'm going to walk around a while. Avienda rose to her knees, and Egwene stood, but neither followed him. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?